Hi, my name is Peter. I'm an emergency medicine resident in Stockholm, originally from Denmark. And today I want to talk with you about um, the Bayesian approach to orthopedic surgery, um, or should I say minor trauma in the emergency department. So I will not go into uh, major trauma, uh, like ACLS or European trauma course kind of material um, at, this at this time, but I might uh, at another time go into that. Um, so why should you bother with this video or learning about minor trauma in the emergency department? Well, first of all, through my career, at least, um, working in Denmark and working in Sweden, it's almost different each time uh, at every department. Um, in some departments, the minor trauma part of the emergency department is a very big part of the um, of the population that you see in the emergency department. Um, but in some emergency departments, just like the one I see right now, uh, I'm in right now, it's not the biggest part, and it's quite a small part of that. So, um, if we want to become a whole emergency, emergency emergency physicians that know about the areas that we should know about, we need to um, be aware that this area um, is something that we often need to to know quite a bit about. And um, depending on where you've trained, you might not have been exposed for uh, for this um, area of emergency medicine. So that's why I'll try to um, bridge that gap by doing this um, this video marathon lecture on on the emergency physician's approach to emer to emergency um, orthopedics or minor trauma. Um, of course. Even if you're working at an emergency department where there's no um, specific orthopedic or minor trauma area, then a lot of our patients are multi, um, multi-modal, so to speak. They're undifferentiated. Uh, um, so even though you might see a medical patient, well, who, who suffered syncope uh, or any other uh, thing or any other um, problem that might have caused them to um, either lie on the ground or faint or um, hit something. Um, or they might have a um, occult compartment syndrome, or they might have something that delves into the orthopedic area. And if you've not been exposed to this, then you might miss it, or you might work it up insufficiently. Um, in my time in neurology, I've picked up uh, quite a few uh, hip fractures with old people coming in with... Um, with not being able to move one of their legs. Um, so this is something that not often um, is a huge problem in departments where there's only medical services as the more surgical or traumatic part of the patient presentation is, um, if not neglected, it's, it's at least worked up insufficiently uh, oftentimes. Um, and uh, that's why we as emergency physicians also need to know about this area, even though we don't have a specific um, minor trauma area in our department sometimes. And again, I always like to have a reason to talk about uh, base and patient theory. And um, orthopedic surgery is an area that maybe um, before the entrance of emergency medicine on the scene, has been uh, done really brilliantly by orthopedic surgeon, surgeons uh, for a long time. And as we will talk about in a little while, uh, the tra the, their tradition of thinking um, sometimes will um, not apply to us. And we should delve into a more Bayesian kind of thinking where, um, where we don't see um, the uh, X-ray as a <laughs> as a rule in rule out tool necessarily, if you have a high precess probability, but we'll go into that. Then I want to make a disclaimer as always. Um, I have I'm not the emergency physician who has had the most experience in orthopedic surgery. I have had some, um, maybe a few months uh, worth of um, orthopedic surgery, but there's definitely uh, a lot of you who will be listening in. 
uh, on this video who's had more experience. And currently I'm not in an emergency department that has that much uh, emergency orthopedic surgery. Um, so um, so um, take what I say with a grain of salt and uh, as always um, look up the links yourself to, to make your own assumptions and always follow your own local protocols. When that is said, um, I think um, I will uh, shine a light on some areas that we are not often talked about in Scandinavian uh, orthopedic surgery. Um, my um, to kind of bridge the, um, I, I always try to calibrate um, the uh, foam, uh, the foam literature and the evidence-based literature with some of the practical, um, the practical. Uh, on the ground experience and uh, as part of that I usually take some kind of course and the only course I, that I know of is uh, in emergency orthopedic surgery for emergency physicians is this course that I uh, recently attended in uh, Gothenburg and uh, which is was really great um, and um, a lot of the uh, or sorry, not a lot of it, but some of the slides and some of the knowledge um, comes from from this course that I can recommend. All right, so as per usual, uh, the links um, for this entire lecture, I will put them uh, here so you can go and check yourself. Um, for the Bayesian approach uh, and the talk about how to to use the Bayesian approach and especially the scared of mnemonic that we'll use, uh, I'll recommend uh, Arun Sayal's, um, especially the Sank Mongo's podcast. If you only want one and want to listen to one thing for 45 minutes, then you got it. Um, otherwise, he has his lectures in EMU on Vimeo, uh, the author Pearl lectures um, here, and they're really good as well. Then he has a course himself. I haven't attended that, but uh, there are some YouTube videos from that that are really good. And then um, EM Cases has done a lot of videos with Aaron Sayal, and recently they did the um, ep episode 175 76, where they um, went through this scared of mnemonic that he's presented uh, in other occasions as well. For the other general topics, here are some of the links that will th that I won't go through in detail, but in general, maybe just highlight this. Uh, the geriatric traumatology is a really important lecture because most of our um, most of our patients coming into an orthopedic uh, or a medical environment uh, emergency department is uh, elderly and they there are some um, nuances that we need to know about um, all right and then I want to highlight as well it's always nice to, to practice cases when you've after you've seen sit, uh, sat through a lecture like this and you can ch check out cases here on this link uh, that's the, the best I've found uh, on the film at Sphere, but there might be others, and please comment below if you find anyone, uh, any any, court, any cases there. Um, all right. Um, these are some general links that are really good. So EM cases, uh, as I alluded to already, are really good in orthopedics. EMU with RN Sayal is really good as well. There is the Center for Medical Education uh, on YouTube that usually do some really good author videos as well. Um, for if you know we need to know anything about a specific topic like shoulder rotator cuff injuries, um, then the best like evidence based and um, um, fairly uh, ex fairly reviewed. Uh, foam at uh, source it would be author bullets it's really really great and then there's uh, a few others here in, in among other in swedish okay um still some links so for the specific when we go into sh uh, the upper arm and lower arm um then then these are the links that i've used um among other these are the main links I've used, um, and for the back and the um, the the leg, and for soft tissues, I've also used some of the some of the um, uh, links um, that I showed before and and here. For X-rays, here are the ones that I've used. Um, 
and there is this book um, that I um, used to use a lot uh, called Accidents and Emergency Radiology uh, that I can recommend for sutures and antibiotics. Um, you can check out the there's lots of YouTube video videos on how to do sutures, but the evidence about it is really vague. And I guess the best attempt on uh, to to, to kind of um, commemorate all the evidence on lacerations and suture techniques and so on uh, is uh, uh, first 10 EM's ongoing laceration repair series. Um, uh, like long story short, it's it, there is not a lot of evidence on this. <laughs> um, Okay, and then when it comes to reductions, both fracture reductions and um, dislocation or luxation reductions, um, you can check out these links. Um, I would highlight um, the for nerve blocks if anyone is interested in that. Then the Sora, uh, um, the Nasara YouTube channel has some great uh, videos on that. All right. And then for the dangerous stuff, I have these links. And for pediatrics, I have a short list. I don't delve much into the pediatrics. I will uh, talk about the pediatrics in the final part of this um, this lecture series, but um, this is not my main focus in this uh, lecture series. My main focus will be on adults. And I have taken the more Swedish tradition in minor trauma, and I've not, I'm not going to talk about head trauma, um, as in Swedish um, medicine, this is <laughs> something that is a part of the abdominal surgeries uh, area. Um, but um, I'm, other than that, I'll talk about um, all the uh, all the um, areas of the body uh, that belongs to the orthopedic surgery. All right, so. The disposition, the disposition of this lecture is actually quite short this time. Um, I will, I will have the first part will be a part of like a general approach for the emergency physician to the orthopedic or the the the, the, the patient with a minor trauma, I should say, because they are they are. We should think of them as undifferentiated patients. It, it, uh, it's also the, your approach to the patients with a syncope uh, that might or might not have some kind of injury that you need to work up for minor trauma uh, as you would a patient coming into the orthopedic clinic. Um, and then after we've gone through all of the, um, the, um, the general approaches um, to, to the, the patient, then we'll go through the um, specific joints one by one, and I'll try to uh, show uh, the can't miss diagnosis and the easy to miss diagnosis, um, because that, this is a thing that will come up uh, later on as well. That of course we shouldn't miss any fractures, but we should probably um, be. But it's it's not it's not the it's not as easy uh, in the orthopedic um, area to just give you a couple of diagnoses that you shouldn't miss and then move on because it, it's more detailed than that. Um, and we will we'll go into why that is. So these are the two areas that we'll go through. And as always, I think this lecture will be maybe um, maybe six to eight hours long. It's 300 slides. Um, but um, uh, and, and I'll recommend that you speed up the 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 uh, uh, time so that so that you don't um, miss out um, and, and so that you don't have to listen uh, to my voice for too long uh, and you can do that on the um, on the bottom you know, of the YouTube video you can just speed up to one and a half or two um, times the speed okay so let's go through um, the uh, the first part here and this would be first of all just a few observations just a few general uh, um, rule of thumbs or observations that I've made in orthopedic surgery and that the FOMED uh, literature um, comes up with as well. All right. Okay, so number one, ortho is a one-to-one -one mechanics and, um, and ortho is complex. So what do I mean by that? Well, orthopedic surgery is usually uh, depicted in, in, on the internet and also in clinic 
uh, as this kind of, well, orthopedic surgeons are so stupid or maybe not stupid, but they're really narrow in their view of medicine. And although there might be some truth to some of that, um, there's definitely, uh, I've definitely come to appreciate through uh, reading up on this uh, this area and and going to courses on the, in this that um, orthopedic surgery is very um, complex and even though um, we may joke about well what what do you call two orthopedic surgeons looking at an ECG <laughs> well a double blinded study <laughs> well um, then I will try to convince you that ortho is actually quite complex um, they just view um they does they usually just um they usually just have a different approach to uh, or, or or they look at the patient at a different um, area than we usually use uh, look at them um but their complexity is not uh <laughs> lacking for that reason so i usually try to have this this um this slide with me uh at uh, at all the lectures i do because um we start up here um, asking, what is, how do we know? How do we know anything in medicine? And this is what we call epistemology. And I think it's, it's hugely interesting. And if you're interested in this area, you should listen to the podcast by Adam Rotman, um, Bedside Rounds. Um, episode maybe 50 is a good one to start with. Um, but in general, how do we know something? And we, 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 we might know something from uh, pure rationalism or what, what I might call the mechanical argument. Um, we might also know something, so, sorry, the, the rationalism argument or the mechanical argument would be, well, it makes sense that, um, it makes sense from a physiological or a mechanical standpoint that the patient's blood pressure drops. And if we, the blood pressure drops, well, then we should give them fluids because then the, then the intravascular volume will um, be, go up. And well, you, you can see, well, there is some <laughs> reason to that, but the, the mechanical argument can easily be diluted by simplification or a incomplete understanding of the complex nature of the human body, and spe especially when it's um, pathological. Then you have traditionalism and pragmatism. And that's usually, well, we've always done like this, so why shouldn't we do it again? And that's might, called, uh, might, might also sometimes be called, um, uh, instead of uh, evidence-based medicine, it's, it's usually, uh, oh, I, I forget the name right now, but... Um, Eminence-based medicine, yes, evident eminence-based medicine. That it would be like we do this because of the tradition, not because it's rational or because it's actually evidence-based. Um, then you have empiricism, and like experienced, we've experienced this, and therefore we do it like this. Um, and this might be unsystematic, like this is my personal clinical experience, or this is my the experience of the department that we usually we, we do like this because we have we experienced it like that that's different from the traditionalism that not necessarily is built on any experience or um just just uh, just some kind of well usually we don't really know and then the systematic the population-based evidence-based medicine and of course each of these sources of knowledge has their own problem especially this one is probably the most problematic one but these are definitely not without their problems and different problems in medicine or different um, um different issues um needs uh, needs all of these <laughs> we can't just use one of them it's my uh, conclusion in uh, more and more we, we we need all of these and and certain areas of medicine are using more of these um like like more rationalism and some areas i'm using more empiricism um or evidence-based medicine and um the reason why i wanted to talk to you about this specific area in orthopedic surgery is that i think that ortho is much more mechanical than medicine there are certain areas that are much more mechanical and where it makes much more sense i think to be able to think rationally and mechanically about the things because the um because the problem isn't necessarily 
that complex it's more um simple um not saying that the area is not hard or, or the orthopedic surgery is not complex but but saying that um when you break a bone well there are definitely some nuances on that but like you can mechanically think about how to how to reduce that so that the ends meet up um it's much easier to have a mechanical kind of thinking about that um than explaining why blood pressure should go up or down when the patient is septic and you should use vasopressors or not and so on because that that's more in uh, there are more moving parts so to speak it's more intrinsic there is more nuanced so to speak that uh, so so i think it makes sense for us and for the emergency uh, sorry for the orthopedic surgeons to think uh, in this area much more mechanically there's another area like neurology is also an area where um, the neuroanatomy is is set up so in such a way that is what I would call one to one. Like if you have one lesion, usually you will have that kind of um, you, you, the patient will present with that kind of deficit. Um, so it's kind of logical logical in that way. In in a way that medicine isn't really because usually or 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 is to a much lesser extent. So it's. It, it, I think it makes sense in orthopedic surgery and in neurology to to think much more rationally and to think much more um, like this. Or in medicine, they. I think we need to rely a bit more on, especially evidence-based medicine. And I think, as I will t uh, talk to you about in a bit, a bit later, that. Well, why are we not using point of care ultrasound in so much in, in orthopedic surgery or in maybe neurology or and there are lots of reasons for that um that it's not related to this but i think one of the reasons might be that well our clinical examination in in medicine is quite um, what could we say it's quite bad <laughs> um it's it's not very um thorough i mean even if you're an expert at that and, and how do we know we're an expert is, is a separate question what's the integrated reliability what's the sensitivity and specificity and the likelihood ratios of all of our examinations um i think it's a much more dull tool the clinical examination in medicine uh than it is in orthopedic surgery or or in neurology and for that reason i think the point of care ultrasound is much more important in 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 um in medicine because it it, it closes the gap the, <laughs> that that or, or it's such a valuable tool in addition to the clinical examination um, um, because the, the, the clinical ex exam is, is so lacking um, but I don't think it's the same kind of good tool in emergency uh, in, in orthopedic surgery or neurology um, but in, spe in, spe in specific uh, specifically in, in in orthopedic surgery i don't think um for the clinical um f uh, like as a tool to further advance your um diagnostic uh, reasoning i don't think that it puts too much value and you have the example in a achilles uh, achilles tendon rupture where it usually just muddies the picture um because the clinical examination and the history usually is enough and you don't need another test. And if you do another test, it usually just makes it more confusing. Yeah, so um, this means, all of this means that in, in orthopedic surgery, um, as I've been told on this course, I was, I was recently attending um, um, uh, the lipus course, um, I was told that like when emergency medicine came into uh, the picture in Scandinavia and, and in Sweden, uh, it went quite well. And I'm, uh, this is anecdotal. Uh, don't uh, don't uh, read too much into this, but anecdotally speaking, um, when when emergency medicine came into the picture here in Scandinavia and in, in Sweden, in um, in medicine in the emergency medicine part uh, of the department, it went really well in the emergency medicine uh, or in the emergency surgery part it went really well like abdominal surgery urology and neurology and so on as well these other specialties it went quite well but in orthopedic surgery it didn't go so well and i think 
there are some reasons for that. I think one of them is that we might rely a lot on on, on this area, like uh, in medicine and, and 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 in surgery and also CT scans. So so the lack of the physician um, uh, isn't that, that strong here. Not not saying that all emergency physicians are lacking, but if you suddenly have uh, some new people. Um, trying to to get in on an area um, and and for good reason and so on, but uh, there will be there, there will be a risk of some like over the entire population of emergency physicians going going into these areas. There will be some lacking skills in some areas, and I think uh, the areas where you can just do CT scans um, uh, that, that 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 these are areas that that might you 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 will they will make up for your deficits in a lot of ways and i think as a, at a population level it won't look like a big problem um and i don't think it will be either um but in it seems like anecdotally that in in orthopedic surgery there has, has been um, a bigger problem with the implementation of emergency physicians and um some of the reasons why it might be that well, emergency medicine, um, or sorry, orthopedic surgery uh, in the emergency department uh, requires anatomical knowledge. You need to know the, anat the anatomy to kind of know what kind of bone you're pushing on and and some of the mechanisms um, for these and, and which bones are usually really well um, healing really well and which bones are not. Um, you need to know this rationalism. Um, there are things that needs to be known here that are taught traditionally in, in in orthopedic surgery, but we are not part of that culture. So that's why I think part of that is we are lacking that kind of an, uh, anatomical knowledge, and 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 also not we're not gaining that kind of experience, like that kind of insurrectal reliability in all of the tests. We're not becoming experts at clinical examination through this kind of anatomical knowledge. Um, if we don't have any um, um, champions in our emergency department that just knows about emergency orthopedics and can show us. Um, and then some of the other reasons might might be that suddenly it's all ages and all sex and um, and and there are different like as we will talk about a child breaks a bone differently than a. Um, or a child that falls have a different injury usually than an elderly than a, than a young fit um, patient. So uh, there are differences there, and it's the entire body that might not be that big, bigger problem. But um, managing um, there might be a problem with this is a, quite a area that is low evidence and is very much me mechanics. Um, there are some evidence, um, but <laughs> and it's coming more and more um, and. Again, anecdotally, some of the, one of the course directors for this course um, told us as, that if a, an orthopedic surgery paper comes uh, out in JAMA, then we should listen because it is it's rare. And but if it does, then like a good RCT, then then we should listen um, because there's some kind of a filter. He he thought in the orthopedic surgery, or well that if there is science, then then it's really important. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so so a big bubble here. Uh, this is uh, the main thing in orthopedic surgery, I think. Uh, that's just my argument here. But um, and I think evidence-based medicine is less, and there might not. I think there might there there is a really huge gap in there. There's a lack of evidence-based medicine in in much of emer of orthopedic surgery, and that I think partly that is a tradition traditional. Thing, and it's also a problem because even though there is a lot of rationalism and um, as John Ioannidis and a lot of other evidence-based like pioneers will say um, that most of what we do are not parachutes and when we do the RCTs on these things uh, like even surgery they've done a lot of sham surgery um, RCTs lately on like arthroscopics uh, and other things in orthopedic surgery, and when we, we we find out that well, it didn't really help the patient in any patient patient oriented outcome way. It didn't really uh, do anything. <laughs> um, so why should they go go through the risk of uh, doing surgery? Well, that's what we have to think about at least. And a lot of the a lot of the fractures that we'll talk about. Well, we also have to always have to think about well, what's the why should we even bother? 
doing surgery on these. Oftentimes, they will do just as well without. And what is won by surgery is usually only a few weeks of healing faster. But that might be good if you need to uh, if you need to be immobilized in that uh, time. So it depends. But I'm just saying that even though it mechanically, look, mechanically looks really good to just do the surgery, well, then you, when the evidence come fr- comes through, it's not it's all it's more nuanced than that at least. And a lot of things heals quite good. Or if it doesn't heal quite good, um, sometimes or oftentimes it actually gives the patient a good function anyway. So so. Lots of things to bear in mind here. That's why part of why orthopedic surgery is actually quite complex. Okay. All right. Um, the final point in this matter of um, uh, maybe the, dif- the differences um, uh, between emergency medicine and orthopedic surgery or um, our view upon uh, orthopedic surgery as simplistic Um I wanted to sh- share this slide as well uh, on this matter. And usually uh, what we like to see in emergency medicine is that we think of all patients as undifferen- undifferentiated. Then we um, find some kind of constellation of symptoms and we don't always need to n- n- know a diagnosis um, depending on the time critical nature of the presentation. Uh, oftentimes we only get to somewhere in the middle here, a syndrome management, and then we treat that kind of syndrome and see if we uh, we, we feed back uh, whether our treatment actually works. And then we use that kind of information to uh, as a test as well, um, what Scott Weingart would call OODA looping, um, before we have all the results. And as I've alluded to before, diagnosis is not what we actually want to know about in emergency medicine. We want to rule out the dangerous stuff or minimize the risk of mini- uh, of dangerous stuff and then what is left is v9 that could be followed up um, and in orthopedic surgery we do have some diagnoses um, that we want to rule out we do have some syndromes or diagnoses that we want to rule out that are time critical and we'll get back to those um, but it's a bit harder in emergency, uh, there, are, there are certain limitations that we that make us actually want to uh, f- sometimes find the diagnosis in in, in orthopedic surgery as well, um, because if we if the patient walks out of the clinic with that with a potential fracture and we miss it, even though it's not dangerous at the time or time critical, then uh, this may lead the patient to get an operation uh, later on that they didn't need. So, so sometimes in orthopedic surgery, we do, we do need to know a, a bit more about the benign stuff as well. And I've alluded to this before as well, that uh, knowing the benign stuff can sometimes have a good effect on the what you would call the, the diagnostic landscape. So, for instance, uh, my preferred example is if you have a dizzy patient that presents kind of like a, an AVS and acute vestibular syndrome, but you do a this whole pike and everything fits and uh, they have the exact correct um, um, uh, nystagmus, um, which would be associated with maybe BVV um, of a um, posterior canal, then then the risk of that being a stroke is really low because that's a really high, uh, highly specific test. Um, and so, so sometimes you can rule stuff in by uh, knowing, you can rule dangerous stuff out by uh, simply shifting the diagnostic um, likelihood um, of the more benign diseases if they are um, if they can be tested uh, like like this whole pike um, like a, with a good test um, a bad example would be migraine a lot of dangerous stuff mimics migraine and, and that doesn't mean that oh i know the migraine criteria you should just diagnose migraine and everything every time you have a patient that actually lives up to the migraine criteria because the, those tests are not specific they're quite sensitive but not specific and 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 so that will make you um under diagnose a lot of the dangerous stuff so but in the big surgery it's a bit different um and um when talking about the differences between the emergency physicians and um, and um, orthopedic surgeons, then we are usually mostly interested, I would argue, in the 
the first part of, of, of this story. It's not that we're not interested in the treatment, and especially I usually uh, emphasize how important information is for, uh, and communication is throughout this entire um, uh, thing. And we, uh, we definitely should be really good at informing um, the conclusion to the patient about these things in a in language that they can understand. That's hugely important. Uh, otherwise, they will not, not have all the, all of this workup might have been for nothing if they come back tomorrow and they hadn't haven't understood what they actually were told. Uh, um, so, but as a general measure, uh, we might think like this. And orthopedic surgeons might, in my in my experience, think a bit more like this. They they might not. They they usually. They, their interest is peaked when we have the diagnosis or we have when we have an x-ray with a fracture for instance and they, they're they're really peaked on the how do we treat this how is, do they need surgery don't they need surgery and so on where we might just i mean we're going to go through a lot of treatments uh generic treatments for some fractures in this lecture and uh, as all, every place i've ever worked we have these kind of cookbooks Oh, that it's that kind of fracture. Okay, well then you just do this. That's and that might be where the emergency physician kind of lose interest sometimes, because it but because it just it's almost just a cookbook. Um, and there certainly are areas where you can use the cookbook and you should, and always use your uh, your local guidelines. But uh, orthopedic surgeons might say that there is no cookbook, and this is where the complexity comes into their their world, especially I think. Because um, <laughs> there are no cookbooks, there are only bones and patients, and it really depends. Like, who does the bone belong to? What's the, um, how is the bone fractured? How risky is it? And so on and so forth. Uh, for, to just manage conservatively, what what can be gained, what can be lost, um, much more than actually sometimes a lot of orthopedic surgeons would argue could could be actually told through these cookbooks. So. Um, so, so um, we should probably be more humble towards that. There are much more than to the to the treatment of orthopedic surgery um, patients than, than this cookbook uh, that we have in our local guidelines. And um, orthopedic surgeons should maybe um, be a bit more interested in the undifferentiated uh, symptom base of patients, so that it might be medical, it might be surgical, it might be neurological, and so on and so forth. And before we actually get to getting the diagnosis and what comes before the x-ray is really important for us as we will talk about in a, in a short while okay so that was the first point let's talk about the next, the next like bigger point here pain and expectations management and information is king these are really important concepts in general medicine uh, emergency medicine but um, specifically in orthopedic surgery as well all right so information is king what do i mean by that well, it was kind of what I alluded to just on this on the previous slide. If you have treatment that is um, not, if you if you come all the way through your diagnostic pathway and found out what the patient has, but they don't understand the information, or they don't have an alliance built with you so that they don't trust you, or they um, they don't feel they've been they've been hurt or their problem assessed even though you might have found a diagnosis and the likely reason for the problem then there might be some kind of underlying issue that makes them think that they have not been hurt if you've asked them the questions in a bad way or a very specific way or you didn't give them time to to present their problems then they might feel that oh i haven't told my entire story there's a lot more to it and these are all things that um breaks that kind of bond between the doctor and the and, and the and the um and the patient and it gives a lack of trust and lack of compassionate care and so forth uh, which i've talked a lot about in other videos um if you're interested in that thing sort of thing <laughs> um all right but here specifically in orthopedic surgery i think the information when you know that the patient has a fracture and what they should expect and how they should deal with it are is hugely important so how do you live with this kind of fracture and sometimes this information is hard to get um, but ask your local orthopedic surgeons or um, personally i think these this kind of information should be like really highlighted in in these local cookbooks what should you tell the patient what are the expected um pain um and duration and uh, what what can they expect to 
to get out of this um, after after it's healed how long would it take to heal and like for instance shoulder injuries usually you say like shoulder injuries will become well 80 percent good within maybe six to ten weeks something like that but the last like 20 percent of your function will be gained really slowly over long long times maybe um, months uh, to years and some may, may never gain the entire uh, same function so these things are important to, to tell patients right away and they shouldn't be de deterministic i mean they shouldn't like you shouldn't lose all hope you shouldn't take all hope away from them but you should do an expectation management so that you know when they see the next guy that oh this guy this emergency physician told me that I the surgery was really important and, and we should do it and then the orthopedic surgeon seeing them in the uh, outpatient clinic uh, the following week uh, has a uh, hard job trying to convince them otherwise so we should um, tell, tell try to try to expect uh, get an expect management uh, of expectations uh, early on um, also in orthopedic surgery and and also how to live with the fracture. Um, um, one example would be how do you uh, go to the bathroom how do you bathe how do you like do your act uh, activities of daily living your ADLs um, uh, when can you move will you uh, is it dangerous to move or and so forth so on and so forth and I think we should be only as restrictive as need be it's really in in this game is really l use it or lose it especially for elderly patients with sarcopenia. So it's really important that we don't overstate uh, uh, or overtreat patients with immo immobilizing costs or stuff like that. But the, on, the, on the other hand, we should do what is necessary for the, t for the condition to heal uh, with a good functional outcome. Um, and sometimes, and that's where the, the operations often come in, that you do operations um, to um, make the time in costs um, and immobilization shorter. That's, as I understand, understand it, um, for a lot of operations in orthopedic surgery, in the emergency of orthopedic surgery with fractures, that's the reason why they often operate. Um, it's not that it won't heal, it just heals a little bit faster. And then you have to weigh the risks and benefits of having um, stuff put into your body that might have to go out at a later point because it's annoying when it's healed and you still have a metal plate. The example would be a clavicle fracture, uh, a, a, a myth, a mid clavicle uh, fracture. Okay, so um, we talked about the realistic expectations. You need to uh, <laughs> uh, tell right away whether or not this is going to be a long healing process or not. Um, uh, without taking the hope away from the patient, but also like giving this like balanced uh, view of what to expect. Um, then we have to, at least in Sweden, um, do a good uh, forsakings medicines, besluts um, uh, Sorry, uh, do a good forsakings medicines hook in tuk. Like um, the the patient having a fracture uh, like will not be able to work um, with labor some uh, work the next couple of weeks and, and we should um, uh, in the emergency department uh, do this um, uh, quick and took so that they can have sick leave uh, for that amount of time so they don't have to be stressed about that and there's a um, there's a um, um, the reason why i wrote this is um, there is a um, there is a guideline or, or or soft guideline i would say uh, where you can see how long the healing process according to um to um, insurance medicine for seconds medicine would take and you can just write that at the beginning of uh, as, as a as a guideline for different fractures so check out for seconds medicine special studios on google and then you'll find their guideline on orthopedics and then you can kind of gauge how long it will take all right, um, we alluded to what the risks and benefits would be for operations. Usually that is that is not our thing to do. It's usually um, orthopedic surgeons to do, but sometimes um, we have to decide whether this patient should be followed up or not. And sometimes the patient ha has a, a different view of whether they should be followed up or not, which is understandable. Usually sometimes some fractures looks awful on the pictures and 
uh, but heal really well. And we have to know that. We have to know which fractures should and should not be followed up. Um, um, and what happens if they don't get followed up? What happen, happen if you if you treat uh, or you don't treat with operation? What are the risks and benefits? Sometimes we do have to need we need this kind of information, if, and if we don't have it, then we have to try to find it or um, or ask our orthopedic surgeons um, for for this information as well. Um, as I uh, I forget her name, but there's these three questions that are really important in any patient doctor encounter when it comes to treatment decisions and shared decision making and that would be um the first one is um how sure are we of the condition uh, that we think i have is what i have and the next one is is well if given that i have this condition um what are my treatment op options including not treating at all risks uh, or harms benefit um uh, for 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 treatments and uh, also uh, how much evidence or how, how, how sure are we that these are going to work or harm me. Um, and the third, third, uh, third question that patients should ask the doctor is, is um, um, what is your recommendation as an expert? Knowing me as a, a patient expert in my, myself and you've now, now listened uh, to me, then uh, you as a doctor expert, how... How, how would you consult my decision making here? Uh, what would and that doesn't mean that necessarily what would you do as a as an individual because then you're using your own patient experience. Um, you, it's more like you should use your own doctor experience, like uh, knowing what some of the elements, what makes up important stuff from the patient's life, um, and knowing from your doctor experience and knowledge what would your rec recommendation be. And don't feel hard if uh, don't feel don't, don't feel bad if the patient doesn't take your advice, um, yeah. And then also, um, sometimes as we will talk about later, uh, the pretest probability of the condition is high, and the X-ray is negative, or the tests that we <laughs> are going to use to diagnose this is is not good enough um, to decrease the process probability enough to rule out the, the, the more dangerous disease. The, the classical example in orthopedic surgery would be scaphoid fractures. And here we have to have some kind of conversation with the patient about the risk of immobilization versus um, versus uh, the potential harm of not immob immobilizing. Um, and so we, uh, sadly, as we, we'll talk about later, the immobilization is highly uh, under uh, researched area as I as I uh, when when I look up uh, the studies for this is is really hard to come by like good um, measures of um, how long uh, how um, how dangerous it is to immobilize patients like in terms of muscle mass uh, loss and in terms of functional loss. Um, and I might, I might not have been uh, researching this area in uh, good enough, but but it seems like, and I've asked around, it doesn't seem like there's much evidence here, sadly, even though it's something that we do all the time. Um, but we'll, we'll get to that. Okay. Talking about pain here and what kind of information we should give, it's important to know about the fear avoidance uh, spiral. And this is something I can talk a long time about, and I will try to make it short. So if you have an injury, and then we then we usually uh, then we have some kind of pain experience. Pain is a central part of usually minor trauma, and depending on you might say that oh well pain you can you, you pain is always the same, but it's not the same. Pain is a stimuli that is peripheral and goes into the brain, and then it, be, it becomes modulated th through this pathway, the gate, the the, the, gate, uh, the pain gate um, hypothesis or theory, and. Uh, the brain, like our previous experiences with with pain, our expectations of what kind of pain this, this is, um, modulates whether or not we are and our our coping strategies and all of these things. <laughs> they will um, they will come together and, and and kind of our culture as well of how we express pain and, and the culture of um, whether we think this is a dangerous thing or not. Um, both both microculture, like within a family or within a uh, hospital setting, or also macroculture without different within different con countries or cultures, ethnicities, um, 
all this comes together to to like add up to what our pain experience is and this is much this can be modulated um so a lot of us will often um catastrophize this is normal in in like this is a spectrum of normality but catastrophizing like thinking uh, oh like if i if i twist my ankle and it hurts then i might um think that oh th th this is it's going to be it's broken because i can't stand on it oh no and even if it's broken if i keep if i keep walking on it then it'll just i can hear the cracks i can almost hear them i uh, in, in the bone and it must be broken and so on so so you can you can like catastrophize and, and like spiral into this um then you get this pain related the fear um where you don't want to like even like touch the foot um and don't even walk on it until you get that x-ray and and you become even more hyper vigilant so you'll just oh you will zoom in on every part of your body to see uh, so it's like oh did it hurt my knee as well like, I, I think i hurt my knee as well and you you like so the, the body is this a white noise background that's always there's always symptoms to pick up on um but when you are experiencing something or when, when you're in a bad way or when uh, when you're um having um uh, pains uh, or you're worried about a symptom then then you'll you, then you'll um zoom in on these things you'll become hyper vigilant and if you if you're not uh, able to like let go of that then you will just keep on trying to uh, you, this wide noise of all symptoms that we all have all the time we're just ignoring them or dissociating uh, from them because that's how the body works in a then, then if we zoom in on them, oh, I, I also have a bit of palpitations, and I also have the, uh, and then you'll just they'll just grow and grow, and, um, and and that will make it more painful. And so, so this is like the fear avoidance spiral. So, we'll, so we and and we, let's see. So, if you if you're interested in this kind of thing, which I'm very interested in, <laughs> because I think it's it's part of like almost all patient encounters. Um, and if we do it badly, then we can really harm the patient and the patient's journey. Um, if you're interested in it, Susanna Solomon has written these great, great books about this uh, for a more popular science kind of way of um, getting into this. It's something that we talk a lot about in my favorite like subspecialist in neurology, um, but uh, it's something that it's not spoken that much about in other specialities. And I think it's really important that all the specialties really are aware of this <laughs> because all of their patients have partly this or a, a big part of this and um um and 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 uh, the way we as doctors describe these things through criteria through making a diagnosis why, why especially if the diagnosis is not specific like let's take back pain well, you have back pain, you have a disc herniation. Well, disc herniation is something that usually needs some MRI to actually diagnose, but but most of us go around with disc herniations asymptomatically um, from studies from Brzezinski, uh, 2015, among others, um, where you can see like population-wise, a lot of us have asymptomatic uh, disc protrusions. Um, and so 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 when we you, when we do these subjective classifications of uh, what, what or interpretations of what the patient says the what we think the patient has we we are we are putting them into a box and the problem with this is a process called templating they will often adjust to that box and become that box and <laughs> um it's also called the classification um uh, uh the classification um problem i think it's called um where where, where we uh, like or medicalization of normal problems and so on and so forth and it's, it, it comes into the discussion of whether or not we should either give diagnoses for for minor things for patients and a lot of this is about western culture pushing patients um in um, in insurance medicine or in schools or so on to so actually they need a they need a diagnosis to actually get help and oftentimes what they actually need is just better work environments uh, 
uh, or social uh, social help or whatever um, a family member that can help them or anything they don't usually need pills and but that's really hard to get at and that's why as a substitute the western society usually gives them diagnoses and and it's important to i'm not saying that we shouldn't give them diagnoses but um i think we should be very aware of the risk of giving someone a diagnosis especially when it's more benign stuff and when you don't really know actually whether that like like the subjective diagnoses it's all right to have to, just a pain uh, or or an, or a um, symptom diagnosis and then explain the patient uh, to explain explain in words what you're actually uh, diagnosing the patient with what you think this is and how you would think it would be better if they were not diagnosed with any specific um, diagnosis you can read a lot about this in in other books as well alan francis is saving normal uh, but um it's important to, to know that we can be part of this ca catastrophizing. If if they if they come to us and like, oh yeah, you shouldn't move. You should know you you have back pain. Oh, you shouldn't move. You should just lie in bed, lie in bed and don't do anything. That will increase. Um, th th that will emphasize their catastrophizing oftentimes. And so it's really important for us to be calm, to gain the compassionate care alliance, or or be uh, get, get an alliance with the patient and and try to like. Talk to them. Talk to them as well. You have you have pain. That's that's terrible. It doesn't mean that this is anything dangerous or serious. And it's really important to actually move if you can with these things because otherwise you will just get get into the spiral and learn a lot of bad habits and be on a pathway to chronic uh, chronicity, uh, chronic pain, anxiety, and so on and so forth. What's the chicken and the egg here is, is always a debatable, but I think it's both. It's not e either one. We are definitely part of this. Um, so so communication is essential for these all, all patients. But, um, well, I use back pain patients for, uh, for this example because those are really some of the back, <laughs> like where you can really go wrong if you, you, if you tell them um, the bad, wrong stuff. So Sandra Solomon has said this, yeah, uh, like this. For many people, the development of symptoms is, is not uh, about a specific traumatic events, but rather a related embodiment, uh, expectation, and belief, and, and the stories that we tell. Um, and this is from this Leaving Beauty book. So it's, it's really not... It, it, like, if I twist my ankle and I think this is going to take a long time before, I will never become a good um, football player again, or I can never do this again, then, then I will usually... It, it will be it will become like a confirmation bias so it's important to to not um <laughs> give the patient the wrong idea and it's important as bernard Lowen says that don't use words that maim don't restrict patients unnecessarily so if you're unsure then be unsure um but 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 you should explain your uh, on uh, uh, your that you're unsure. Your um, you, we should tolerance the, tolerate this uncertainty because there's never there's never total certainty, and and the patient, no matter how many tests they want, they, they, there is never certainty, and it's better to try to think of the entire biopsychosocial uh, aspect of their symptoms rather than chasing down the biological um, only. Okay. Um, so hopefully we can go get the patient to the right path here, get to the, to the no fear path, um, and a, a mindfulness um, um, uh, saying is that you can be hit by two arrows. There are different kind of ways of saying this, but when you, when you when you twist your angle, you're hit by the first arrow. That's the painful part, and you can be hit by the second arrow as well if you keep kicking yourself over it and you keep um, becoming afraid and be you're reacting uh, to this all the time um, that that's the second arrow and that's really a um, we need to make make sure that they only are hit with the first arrow so to speak um, so yeah, and if we feel like they're being caught up in this then it's like distraction uh, explanation of base basic cognitive, cognitive behavioral therapy um, uh, ways of handling this like slow breathing or calming down or uh, there are different ways <laughs> i'm not a psychologist but it's it's we should probably should know some of these basic things um in especially this model called the cognitive diamond how 
um, behave how our thoughts um, and behavior and uh, psychological sensation and feelings they interplay all the time. So I, I think something about w what I'm experiencing, then then I then it becomes oh no, I'm I'm it must be a cancer, it must be um, something broken, and then I spiral out of control through through the emotions that are attached to that and that just it's the same uh, as, as this actually um so this cognitive diamond is like a central element of the cbt cognitive behavioral, behavioral therapy um and it's really important to when talking with patients to actually know stuff about this i think just another picture of normal physiological phenomenon like back pain um, but uh, like this kind of white noise that we have always in the body and some have it more than others but we don't pay attention to it but on some days we do and then we go to the doctor because this was definitely something different and it must be something wrong um, and then if we the, if the doctor goes along with this i'm not sure as i said i'm not saying that we shouldn't go along with it sometimes but we should allude to the fact that it's not necessarily purely somatic this and we don't need an mri oftentimes but we need to be able to convince the patient of this and that's really that's becoming increasingly harder in the in the um, risk averse environment that we usually practice in in western uh, medicine um, and it's also risky for the doctor, sadly, um, because if they go to another doctor and get the test and they find, oh, I did have a disc protrusion. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean that that was the, the reason why. And yeah, so so in my opinion, we um, we have a really hard task, uh, a job um, about um, w about doing this. And the easy, the default mode is just to give the patient what they want. Usually, that's not what they need. We should try to explain to them, even though it takes five minutes more, instead of just giving them what they want. Um, because in the long run, that is the better choice for the entire healthcare system and for that patient especially, and for us, because we will not burn out in the same way if we are compassionate and can communicate. Um, there's a book called Compassionomics, if you want to read more about that. Okay. Um, and if we if we keep like pushing the patient towards this uh, area here, then they can get into like the uh, like the where it becomes almost syndromes like functional uh, neurological uh, disease or um, chronic uh, chronic bodily distress and so on and so forth, fibromyalgia. And there's definitely some patient factors here as well, but um, it's important to know that somatization, like the expression of psychological, emotional factors as physical somatic symptoms, is really normal. It's something that we all do all the time. And sometimes if it's if we grab hold of it in the westernized medicine, non-holistic and very narrow way, then we are at high risk of moving them towards the this side. And it's not just on an individual level, but on a system level. And on the system level, I think Morten Soderman um, Danish professor of um, uh, infectious medicine in, uh, in Odense has, has uh, made um, one uh, or two really great books about this and one of them is Sorba, Dikadu Sølberg about how the system is making the patient vulnerable uh, and we should probably be much more aware of this so that we can make a more fair and uh, giving system <laughs> instead of just uh, attending to the ones who actually have resources. Okay. Um, so Wayne Jonas is a private practice physician who has made this uh, this book called, um, or he's, he's done a lot of research on, especially especially what he calls the meaning response, or what he can also call the placebo effect, that we that. Like eighty percent, he usually quotes eighty percent. I don't know where he has that kind of like that 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 um, number from, but a, around eighty percent of what we um, um, w of the treatment that we give is a kind of a meaning response, uh, part of the compassionate care, part of part of all of this, and we should probably not see placebo effect as a as a just a uh, dummy pill. Um, we should see it as a 
um, a thing that we can use all the time. I'm not saying you should use blank pills or uh, dummy pills. I'm saying that you should take um, the placebo effect or the meaning response, like the alliance with the patient, the communication, the um, when you when you're talking about a treatment and this will then if, if it if it will work then I will just emphasize oh, this this is going to work and uh, like he, he he in his books he talks about how you can do this uh, in a more um, a more helpful way towards the patient um, and also in an evidence based way um, and he is controversial and and you should read him with a grain of salt but he's he's done this hope note which is very much like I think the bio biopsychosocial model. All right, so that's a lot about the psychological factors and maybe some about the social factors. Let's talk about more about the biological uh, factors of um, of pain, um, especially as um, these are the patients that we will see in the emergency department all the time and also in the minor trauma area. All right, so we have uh, the biological pain. We have pain types. We have nociceptive pain, we have neuropathic pain, and we have this new, new-ish kind of pain called nociplastic pain. Um, the nociceptive pain is usually from being hurt, like the, the nerve nerves are stimulated directly. Again, I'm no pain specialist, but I think it's really interesting. And I, I know, I, 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 the, please don't hammer me on the physiology of this. Like, but pragmatically, this is like, you you hit your bone and then then the pain uh, the nerve uh, stimuli um, goes to the brain and you're that's that's the nociceptive neuropathic is usually when you have some kind of um, when the then the the when you have the entire nerve then the, there is some kind of disruption in in the nerve that makes you have these radicular pains and I think I believe they can be central like a thalamic pain syndrome like if you have a thalamic stroke. Um, some some thalamic strokes will make you have a central pain syndrome that is really hard to treat and, and very disab uh, disabilitating, uh, for, uh, disabling for patients. But most most of the time we see these peripheral pain syndromes like like sciatica, like um, if you have a um, nerve that has been broken um, in if you maybe have a cyprocondylar um, fracture in your uh, distal humerus, then oftentimes you have some kind of um, um, neuropathy uh, afterwards because of um, the radial nerve being injured, and this can hurt as well. Or if you in your hand have come some kind of broken nerve as well, then you you get some kind of neuroma uh, building if they if they're not operated on, then that can hurt as well. So these are, these are usually neuropathic pains. Some somewhere along the pain the, the nerve pathway there's been some kind of disruption that makes it um, irritated. Um, and then you have the nociplastic pain, uh, which I think is really important <laughs> um, um, uh, concept, especially here in um, in emergency medicine because we do see a lot of pain patients. And um, nociplastic pain, as I understand it, is, 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 is um, when the stimuli um, that if, if you were injured maybe um, six months ago and this, the, like the, you have broken bone and the painful stimuli is now gone, the broken bone is healed, um, but you're still in a lot of pain in that area. Well, uh, then, and there are criteria for this, but the, the general idea is that you have learned, um, sometimes you learn through this pain spiral that I just talked about, like the fear avoidance spiral or, or, and other factors as well. You, you might learn bad, um, bad uh, habits, so to speak, subconsciously. It's nothing, nothing that patient wants to bring on, themse on themselves, but it's through their coping me mechanisms and patterns uh, of behavior that they, they, they and, and, we, and, and we might be uh, part of this as well on how we explain things to them and, or how we don't explain things to them. But then, then like the pain persists because the, the pain doesn't exist in the nerves, it, it exists in the brain. Um, so you have like, um, I'm not sure you have, I'm not sure of the evidence about whether you have a physical area of the, in the brain, but you, but you have a, um, a pattern in the brain at least that keeps firing painful stimuli every time you, you touch that area, even though the area itself is, is, is normal. So it becomes maybe hyperalgesic, um, uh, and sometimes allogenic, like you, you feel a, um, a different kind of, um, 
like if you blow on the area, then you will feel pain. That like a non-painful stimuli producing pain. Um, yeah. So, and we see that um, in a lot of areas, but especially maybe in back pain, where you well the disc is healed, but you didn't move, and you're afraid this might happen again, and then you're like in a fear avoidance spiral, and now you have chronic pain, partly because maybe a doctor told you to not move. So, nociceptive pain is really important as well. Okay, so nociceptive pain is what we usually in minor trauma would, will be um, exposed to. And you can pragmatically uh, talk about three areas. Um, constant pain, um, even though no matter what, whether you move or not, it, it's constant. Or if it's only in pain when mobilize, mobilizing, but uh, at rest it's all right. Maybe a more inflammatory component there. And then you have visceral pain, like um, for stomach pain or gut pain or so and so on and so forth, uh, pleuritic pain. And um, these, um, let's talk about how we treat these pain patients a bit, a little bit differently. So if you have uh, pain only with mobilization, maybe arthrosis, maybe immobilize, uh, like, like maybe some kind of Im uh, immunological, rheumatic part, then usually NSAIDs are, um, are better than other kinds of medications, um, but um, paracetamol usually doesn't help with this kind of pain, or it doesn't help as much as uh, NSAIDs. Again, this is the evidence light area, and EM cases has done a, a, a um, review on this, and and it doesn't entirely agree on the, on these things, but um, you can check out these um, links as well to 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 um, uh, to get a uh, your own uh, keep a, uh, get a known view of this. Um, for incest, you have your COX inhibitors, you know, naproxen, ibuprofen, and so on, and on. And I guess there's a th theoretical um, theoretical lower risk of um, of GI bleeds with Celebra or Celecoxib. Um but um, I, as I as I recall, the, the studies on this are not entirely uh, non-funded by the industry, and so on and so forth. So, um, all right, but. And if if they have strong pains, um, then that you can even either for certain certain things do like a corticoid uh, injections, or you can just do strong opioid, opioids. But at that point, sometimes for certain things you have to like put out the joint um, and do um, an operation. All right. All right. For constant pains, these are usually the ones that we'll see. Um, it would it would be minor pains can be treated usually with paracetamol, like back pain and or. And there's no, I, I believe, no evidence between, um, like, differing between NSAIDs or paracetamol. You can use NSAIDs as well here. Um, and, and then for major pain, you go with strong opioids, and it's important to dose it correctly. So it's 0 0.1 milligram per kilogram um, until pain relief. And then I guess you can always, there, is, there are some principles that you should also always allude to. Well, um, about well, this is a general rule of thumb. You, you you can go up in that dose if they're young, and uh, they have tried morphine before. But if the if they're morphine naive or they're older or so on and so forth, then you could start low, go slow. Okay, and then you usually will continue with some kind of if they have a broken bone and you suspect they will have pain for a longer while, uh, then you'll usually give them some kind of um, longer acting uh, opioid. Uh, so that this will be as needed, and this will be um, the um, the base morning and evening. Um, all right. Um, then for the visceral pain, you can you can have colicky pain or non colicky pain. Colicky pain will be like kidney stones, gallstones, and these kind of pains are usually uh, best treated with NSAIDs, like catrolac is is the preferred. Um, and then sometimes you might add buscopan, um, spasmophene, uh, 20 milligrams, but um, I, I usually don't. And it depends on the, on the condition. If it's ileus, then maybe. But in general, um, I, I, I'm, I know the evidence base is quite bad for this. Um, so, uh, and I've never actually used it, but I, I see it recommended in several of these. So, um, And then non colicky pain like... Mm, 
um, your run of the mill uh, acute ab abdomen pain, um, you will treat like a constant pain. And then for neuropathic pain, and it's important to know, like neuropathic pain, there is no treatment that is more evidence-based than the other. There are different uh, choices. And there are the TZAs, tricyclic uh, antidepressants. There are your um, your, your gabapentinoids, your pregabalin, and your some belts. There, there, and there are different ones here. So, um, what is most important with these patients is that you have to expect your manage expectations. There's a quite high numbers needed, to treat, quite low numbers needed to treat, but it will take weeks usually before the effect is achieved, and especially the peak effects will take uh, weeks to months. It does reduce pain, but doesn't, it doesn't usually reduce the uh, all of the pain. It, it mainly reduces the pain at rest, <clears throat> um, so that you can sleep. <coughs> Sorry. Um, but there might be some pain uh, left. Usually, if one doesn't work, you have to try another one. It's usually trial and error. Usually one will work, but you'd never know a priori which one it is. So you have to choose one and try. All right. And um, usually the way you try is by uh, by side effects or preferences. So if the patient has depression along with their neuropathic pain, then TCAs may, might be a good choice for evening. Or if they have sleep depression, um, a sleep deprivation, then, then that might be insomnia. That might be a good idea for TCAs as well. If they have anxiety, then Lyrica or uh, Pregabalin uh, would, would be a, a good choice. Um, and uh, because all of these should be dosed up over a long time, then, uh, then as a general rule of thumb, you shouldn't prescribe them from the emergency department. It should be someone who can follow up their patients, uh, like the, their private practice physicians. Um, you, there's a great, um, in the Danish guideline for neuropathic pain um, from Stone Stuelsen, there is a great um, guideline for this. And there's also a guideline through uh, the NNPV of uh, neurology. Um, in Denmark, so you can check those out. Okay, then here at last, just a few general advice on on um, pain management. And we we talked about start low, go slow, um, depending. So, um, uh, if if you have elderly patients, opioid na naive patients, or patients with polypharmacy with a lot of interactions or kidney failure and so on and so forth, then you have to go away from this rule of zero point one milligrams per kilo, then I'll start maybe half of that or something like that. If they the patient tells you that they have a they usually vomit or they are allergic, quote unquote, to morphine, that usually means that they are vomit vomiting or have a nauseous when they get morphine. And that, that can be effectively treated with either metoclopamide or ondazotrone just uh, 60 minutes or uh, 30 to 60 minutes before. Uh, that you give the morphine, that's a really, really, uh, in my experience, actually a really good uh, um, uh, fix for that, for a lot of patients. And uh, Or you might try another kind of morphine. Um, it's important to know that every time you, every time, just every time you order or you give morphine, um, just make it a um, habit to just prescribe some kind of um, Lexantia. It might be Movicol. Or it might be Lexoverall, uh, something that they can. Uh, Lexoverall is just like droplets, so it's easier usually to, to get uh, to, to get into the patients. But it will get them sometimes some crampy stomach aches. So um, keep in mind when when you're giving it uh, during the day. Also keep in mind that ondansetron, if you're using ondansetron instead of metoclopramide here, that might that that is uh, obstipating as well. So if you both give morphine and ondansetron, it's really really important to give Movicol. So every time you order. Um, morphine, you should order um, a anti-emetic um, and you should also order um, uh, Lexanthia. Keep in mind that metroclopamide, especially for young women, might give them uh, extra peripheral symptoms, uh, uh, Parkinson-like symptoms, and, and, uh, and um, you shouldn't dose them for too long or for, for, with too high doses, but 
usually it's especially in the beginning when you give morphine that they have nausea and they'll wean off um uh, consider always consider like nerve blocking uh so sorry uh, more opioid um sparing agents like um, nerve blocks especially for hip fractures um if it's a complex kind of pain uh, do a pain analysis what's the reasons for the pain are there existential pains is is biopsychosocial matter so uh, don't just throw on more morphine if they have what sounds like nociplastic chronic pain or complex pain syndrome then you should Definitely think about what you're doing. Uh, a lot of pain syndromes um, are because of pain medications. You have medicin medicine overuse headache um, from paracetamol insets, for, for instance. It's really common. Um, you have um, morphine hyperalgesia when you, when you <laughs> paradoxically become, uh, it becomes more painful to take the morphine because it, you become hyperalgesic. So it's really important to actually know what you're treating and which, and then make a plan for each area of the pain, uh, and uh, so that they're treated decently. All right. Um, with kidney kidney injury, then um, a rule of thumb is like um, you should probably avoid morphine or or reduce it. Um, then the next best the best thing is probably to give fentanyl, but usually we don't have that in ketogen. We have that often, but it's also a very addictive kind of op opioid. Um, methadone is a special kind of tr special treatment. So uh, if it's if it's usually I use oxycodone for these patients, and uh, that's the, usually the, the one that is realistically available for me. Um, then always NSAIDs risk it cannot be understated. Um, especially kidney injury if you have ACE inhibitors don't ever use ACE inhibitors and NSAIDs uh, um, along with each other um, the nephrologists uh, I was told usually call that a pharmacological nephrectomy um, so don't use that <laughs> I think the, one of them closes the posterior vessel and one, one, the other one the oh, the afferent and efferent vessels are closed off <laughs> in the glomeruli and then that becomes a <laughs> pharmacological nephrectomy. Also, heart failure. Uh, there's a risk of heart failure, or you can assess, you can increase risks of heart failure if you already have it, or, and ulcers. Uh, there are some studies that I was um, informed about uh, recently that ulcers can can occur really uh, fast, e even after a few days of usage. You can have small bleeds in the uh, in the in the stomach, and this is keep in mind this is not a poo, this is not a patient-oriented outcome necessarily, but uh, just keep in mind that especially patients that are on on other agents, SSRIs, um, warfarin, or other um, um, blood thinners, um, and or have 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 had ulcers before. If you really need to treat them with NSAIDs, uh, which we might need to sometimes, and we really have to start them in a PPI and tell them about the risks. Um, because even though we're talking about risks here, there's also a big risk of not treating the pain, and right? it's it becoming chronic or maybe making the patient delirious from pain, as common in elderly patients as well. So, and don't undertreat the elderly patients just because you're like the elderly patients, for instance, with rib fractures, they really, really need to be able to to stand up and to breathe and don't under treat them. You need to be not pain free, but almost pain free in sitting and in standing mode. If not, then you're under treating them. And that usually needs, then they usually need admission and so on. That, that's actually what they need, because if they don't, then they will be immobilized at home with uh, under treated uh, pain. So don't under treat the pain patients. Um, and then what we haven't talked about, like, this is not a generic list of like headaches, uh, headache pains and stomach pains and so on and so forth, because some, some pain areas you shouldn't treat with morphine. I would not, never treat pa patients with headache with morphine, for instance, uh, unless they have a bleed or something specific, because that is a bad way to go. And there's a lot of biopsychosocial elements in, 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 the he in headaches, uh, so I wouldn't do that. Um, I will go more and more towards this kind of treatment, especially with morphine, if I know that there's a high certainty of this being a specific cause. But again, there are studies in abdominal surgery as well, saying that, well, we should just treat pain. Um, you shouldn't undertreat pain just because we don't know what the diagnosis is. And I, I, I can buy that as well. I, I think we should treat pain uh, right away. 
um, if we can, but morphine is not necessarily the best choice. And that's important to, to know, especially with headache. All right, uh, and especially also with the colicky pain, I think. And um, okay, um, and of course, it's always important to remember non-pharmacological pain management. Um, what I usually, uh, I, I've made an entire lecture on this as well, on on with the example of headaches. So please check that out on compassionate care. Um, we should. Um, Think of the red flags for opioid mis misuse if the patient wants IV instead of uh, per oral only. If the if the effect diminishes after um, faster than what we would expect, like the half time, because the half time of morphine is usually, I think, it depends on what kind of morphine. But if you just use usually normal morphine, it's like maybe I, I think it's like five or six hours, something like that. And the pain shouldn't shouldn't like, like the pain, sh pain shouldn't come back like within. 30 to 60 minutes, uh, at least if you give them a decent dose, then then it shouldn't come back. But if it does and they want more, then it's, it's a breath flag. Um, and well, it's important when you're using long-acting opioids, then you, you only, then you like here, then you then you um, you take the, um, the your dose and uh, your your entire daily dose, and then the the um, as needed um, uh, morphine. Uh, will be a sixth of a sixth of that dose. So if you have maybe mm, 10 milligrams of oxycodone times two, like morning, morning and uh, 10 milligrams morning, 10 milligrams evening, then you will use uh, a sixth, um, uh, uh, then, then the, the entire dose is 20 milligrams of oxycodone. Then the um, then the uh, the treatment will then be a sixth of that. A sixth of uh, twenty, um, so that would be, and that you don't have a sixth of twenty in oxycodone, so that's usually just five milligrams. But when you get into bigger doses, then then it becomes important. Um, and then then the next day, if if they've used all of their all of their six as needed doses, then you will add that to the 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 the, the, um, the long acting dose, so that you dose up. Um, but if they're dosing up too fast, then you have to think about other causes um, as well. Okay. Um, if this is not effectful, then think always think about like could this could this be like compartment syndrome, like morphine resistant pain, um, um, or, or on or other ischemia uh, symptoms like um, neck fash, or or other kinds of um, pain that are like morphine resistant or morphine uh, resilient. Um, and we talked about the other uh, things here. Always think about the existential pain, or um, um, or whether the pain could be um, nociplastic, so that there isn't any injury. We're not treating any injury. We should treat the the brain problem, which would usually be treated by uh, psycho um, biopsychosocial interventions. Okay, and then just. It's important to think like uh, like the imp the your uh, emergency pain. Uh, if you're treated with opioids, then after then, then you can develop this um, uh, uh, resilience to to opo opioids after a time, um, and especially this um, um, opioid induced hyperalgesia uh, um, is something that we often don't talk a lot about, but it's really important to to know that with with uh, moderate doses of morphine, I, th I think um, then you, you can really become <laughs> with chronic use, you, you, you can you can it can become more painful. Sometimes you actually to, to, to treat the pain, you need to do other stuff or we in the emergency department can do this, but we need to tell others to, like we should probably look at this in another way. We should probably try to dose down. In controlled environments, um, right? Yeah. So we, there's a there's a scale here between opioid anxiety and opioid overuse, and we should probably um, we should use it when we need it, and we shouldn't be too anxious about it. But we should be respectful of the risks, and we should use opioid sparing agents when we can. Okay. Some good links for about uh, for 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 especially the psychosocial part of this is Susanna Solomon, Neurosymptoms, and John Stone. Um, but there are others here down here, um, especially 
pain and pain and PSA and pain for ED are really good. Um, emergency physicians, uh, FOMED um, uh, sources that can tell you about um, the more biological uh, stuff and has have great lists of morphine half times and half lives and so on and so forth. All right. On to the third point here. <laughs> um, the third point here is uh, author is also base. Um, so we we shouldn't we shouldn't think of um, um, orthopedic surgery as exempt for, for from the Bayesian uh, theorem. And, and this is a point that I often make. And uh, this guy Arun Sayal, who you um, may, may may have heard on EM cases, especially, but um, also in other settings, maybe, and talks about. He's he, he, so so he. I, I'll use his example here because I think it's it's a good one. Um, so um, usually, um, usually what we think uh, like traditionally uh, when I started off, at least you know, in in in, in you're, you're working in the emergency department. Um, before knowing too much about the Bayesian th uh, theorem, then usually you'll just order an X-ray, and if that was negative, then we'll just oh, we'll send the patient home, and if not, then uh, well, then they will. Um, then there's a fracture, and then you will treat that fracture. The problem here is that um, if there's a fracture, then there might be another fracture. You have to <laughs> assess your pretest probability. There might be a soft tissue injury that is not shown on the X-ray. Um, and so on and so forth. So, so maybe that test isn't the the, the, the X-ray is is a test like any other, and and should not. It's only it only um, changes um, the like the 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 the, um, the process probability. It doesn't rule out or rule in necessarily. Um, um, so we should assess our, like the process probability decently with history, with um, with the examination, and so on. Um, and as part of that, we should uh, we be aware of the red flags. Uh, there are uh, there are there are red flags in emergency medicine uh, in in orthopedics, uh, just like emergency medicine. So some of the red flags, like the red flag presentations, might be well medial mediolar uh, tenderness uh, or external rotation of your ankle. Um, that kind of injury is is an, is a high risk injury, high process probability for a lot of dangerous stuff. So if the x-ray is negative there, then we should definitely think about um, to order other tests or to do follow-up really fast and, and maybe mobilize. Um, so the way he usually uh, he usually talks about it like this, or in Sayal. So you have muscle uh, skeletal injury and then you just do the x-ray and then if it's positive, then you have pathology and then if it's negative, then it's just soft tissue injury. Then it's nothing to worry about. It's just a distortion, um, and then you can just go home. Uh, and we don't. He usually says like we don't think about this <laughs> this, this kind of way in, in the rest of emergency medicine. If you have chest pain and the EG and the shop is negative, then we then then we just don't call it chest pain UNS. Um, and if it's positive, then you call it ACS. Well, there's a lot of other things that chest pain could be that we need to think about here, uh, which which ECGs and TROPs are not a good test for, like my like like um, pericarditis, my um, pericarditis and tamponade, and all those that kind of spectrum of disease, like pulmonary embolism, like uh, aortic dissection, and so on and so forth. So we we we, we should we should definitely think like we usually do also in orthopedic surgery. Um, okay, and this slide is just to remind you guys about um, a bit of the Bayesian um, theory. Um, so this is a phagonomogram, um, and this pretest probability here, this is the um, test, the likelihood ratio of the test, how good it is, the positive likelihood ratio, the negative likelihood ratio, meaning that, and, and the, uh, the f further down it goes, the better the test is. The further up it goes, the better the test it is. This is the, if the test is positive, this is if the test is negative. And here you have the post-test probability. So if you have a pre-test probability of maybe 0 0.5, is really low pre-test probability in a patient then um, of a condition, and you do this test that is, um, uh, that is negative, then, well, you need... <laughs> 
then, 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 then you can rule something out with an extreme. So if you have someone who twists their ankle on an, uh, on an uh, internal rotation, like supination rotation injury, and they're positive on a out of ankle rule, um, and you don't have any other, other suspicions and they can walk, but they have ten, they're tender uh, on the medial, uh, sorry, lateral malleola, and the, the test is negative, then, then, then it's a pretty good test usually, and then you can just, then they, they have a low precess probability, and then they'll just be, be sent home. Um, of course, we always have to think of the um, other stuff, which will allude to the scared off mnemonic, um, um, like the stuff that cannot be picked up by an X-ray because it's not a fracture. <laughs> uh, there might be Achilles, senus, uh, Achilles, Achilles tendon rupture and so on, but uh, stuff like that. And then if you have a high precess probability, then you use the same test. Well, this was an external rotation and uh, the x-ray was negative, but they, they couldn't really bear weight. And, and well, then I would be much more, then that same test is not as good. Um, uh, it's it, it, if the precess probability is really high, is they're really tender, they couldn't bear weight, they have a lot of like um, they might might have ecchymosis, then then the test is even though it's negative, it's not enough to rule out, and this is what Bayesian theory is in a nutshell. All right, so a few tips here as well. The radiologist, your radiologist is not a robot. The patient, the radiologist really need this kind of precess probability uh, that we gain from the clinical encounter. They need that in the referral. They need to know where it hurts the most. They need to know certain things because looking at an X-ray is not just like a, looking at a robot, like 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 a robot screening all of the things. It's it's a human viewing, um, a making uh, interpretation, uh, uh, just like we do, um, um, taking into the taking the context into uh, view. Of course, if there's a big fracture, then it will be visible. But usually, you'll miss the second fracture if you don't describe um, the the matter of the manner of injury or where it hurts the most, or so so on and so forth. So it's really important to do a good referral uh, to the uh, to the to the to our um, uh, colleagues, good colleagues on radiology, um, so that they can do a good assessment. <clears throat> Also, they might um, be able to tell us that, well, that kind of X-ray is not as good for this kind. Of, maybe we should do a CT, maybe we should do an MRI, maybe we should do another kind of view, maybe we should do the central ray. Uh, the central ray of the X-ray should be, po be put in another area. Maybe we should do two X-rays instead of just one showing bad, um, bad exposure of, of, of the entire forearm. Then we should do a wrist and a, a elbow. <laughs> like, uh, it's really important. Um, <clears throat> and it's always Arun Sial would say that if the X-ray is ne if you're in this scenario here and you can get another X-ray and you can like then then usually you have to use the time as a test um, immobilize them and do an, another X-ray in, in a week <clears throat> or a couple of days see if if there's any any change and I think that's a good way of thinking about Bayesian theory. I, I know some, some orthopedic surgeons uh, at our course, um, at the course, um, thought more like, well, more this kind of one-to-one -one thinking. They have the anatomical correct way of examining the patients and so on. They are experts. Um, so their, their clinical examination is so good, they would argue sometimes, that they don't have to if the x-ray is negative if they are ordering an x-ray they are ordering in it, it it really like for a specific reason and if that is negative then they think it's really negative and and that that might be true they are the experts and we are not experts in the same way that they are in orthopedic surgery so um there definitely may, may be some truth to to this <clears throat> Um, but I think at least for as emergency physicians, then we should, um, think about, um, immobilizing the patient. We shouldn't rely that much on our examinations uh, to think that they are that good, um, um, as, as an orthopedic surgeons. Um, <clears throat> there's, then there are some general rules of thumbs here, um, referred pain, um, uh, 
Ah, we will talk about this a bit later in the lecture. All right, so um, we will. This is a like so. So usually in emergency medicine, I would like to think of it like we need to know all the time critical diagnoses. These are all the time critical diagnoses in medicine and surgery, uh, in emergency medicine and surgery, and um, um, this is by Ruben Strayer. Um, he's done this great lecture on, on this as well. If you want to check that out, um, EM thinking, I think it's called. And then, uh, so, so from this, we know all the illness scripts. So if I take one diagnosis, then I have, uh, then I have to build as an emergency physician trainee. I need to know the illness script. What is the diagnosis? How do I diagnose it? What, how big are my likelihood ratios? What epidemiology uh, is is relevant for this case? Like, is it women or men who presents with this? What age group is it? Um, and all of these things goes into the illness scripts. And then by time, I can nuance my illness script to not just to typical cases, but also atypical cases. Well, some aortic dissections do present with um, minor pain and more like they have, um, they might have neuro neurological symptoms as well. And I, I might pick one of those up uh, um, by when I become better and so on. Um, and from this, when we know all the illness scripts, then I know what kind of red flags we should look for when I do the exam. So, so this is kind of the formula for, for knowing what kind of exam you should do. <clears throat> and this is kind of what I'm trying to do here in this lecture as well. Um, in the second part of this lecture, I'll try to do that uh, with orthopedic surgery as well. It's a bit hard though, with uh, harder with uh, with uh, orthopedic surgery, as I talked a little bit about them before, because the severity of a miss in in, in orthopedic surgery is a spectrum. Um, um, so you have the really 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 difficult messes that you shouldn't like compartment syndrome, open fractures, vascular injury, and so on. These should not be missed because they cause severe morbidity and and and, and mortality. But there's different things that shouldn't be missed. Like the, some, some if they are missed, then they then they cannot be operated on, and then 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 you will lose some kind of um, function in that area. A scaphoid fractures, for instance, or Lis Frank's injury, that which will give the patient um, arthrosis in their foot um, further on, and UCL ruptures, uh, epiphyseal lysis. Um, so the, this is this is bad to miss. Um, it's not like this, but it's really bad to miss as well. And then you have these where well, the healing is delayed if we if we miss this kind of fracture or this kind of injury, um, and or 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 your what would have been a conservative management might go have to go on to operational management. Uh, an example would be a vol volar luxation of a finger. Um, and if that is not managed decently, then then that might have to go on to an operation instead of just managing it conservatively. Um, and then you have like the end of like the severity of misses. Well, you, you might sometimes um, unnecessarily immobilize patients if if you're really afraid of missing something and you you just immobilize everyone and that would be a problem as well. So, um, and then you have well how common these things are. Well. This is most common to to miss or to mix diagnose, um, and and usually, but 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 these are even though they're not common, they, they are commonly missed though. So it's really um, we'll try to focus on, on on these things because I think these are the, for emergency physicians the most important. These are something that we should be good at, but it's it's hard uh, and something that we should increasingly become better and better at with our orthopedic surgeon colleagues to know what like minor things we shouldn't miss but we we, we keep our focus here uh, in this lecture on this and less on that but i will also allude a bit to this okay getting to the end of my <laughs> my uh, more soft philosophy part of this the um the, the the general rule here immobilization is not benign as we think and operations are not always as good as we think so just as as i alluded to um i could not find any good evidence for um on patient oriented outcomes that uh, that uh, immobilizing patients is 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 bad but by experience by tradition we know that it is bad because it causes muscle wasting 
um, which w w w and as a rule of thumb, I was told, and this is not evidence, but I was told, two weeks of immobilization can mean two months of rehab, especially if it's a um, like a leg where you um, need to rehab uh, one leg um, and they will, they will become asymmetric because of muscle wasting in one leg and then you will have to, um, it, it takes a long while. And it's just uh, not just the muscle, it's also the neuro memory, kind of like the, your your way like this kind of um, nociplastic <laughs> not nociplastic but plasticity of the brain the muscle memory kind of uh, fades when you don't use it and it takes a little while to, to get into that again and, and 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 we can do a lot of pain by just two weeks of immobilization especially in the legs and over then then you have all the bigger joints joints uh, especially fingers um and and uh, shoulders, elbows, like almost all joints. Um, if you immobilize them for more than uh, three weeks, and some even just even much less than that, maybe just one week, they'll become stiff. And we know this, like the capsulitis, the frozen shoulder, it's a really big problem. So they have to, like we have to take immobilization really seriously, and we have to take uh, rehab really seriously. Like they have to be rehabilitated really fast. We have to pain manage them really fast so that they can get moving as much as they can. What um, um, and if they're allowed to walk on their cast, then they should walk on their cast and so on and so forth. They should not wait for this because it's really lucid or you lucid or use it. Okay. Um, as one of the hand surgeons also said, there's no surgery without extensive rehabilitation. Like they, they, re, the, the, the hand surgeons are, like they, they, they believe that they may play second fiddle to the rehabilitation um, people um, because they are really the heroes, um, as they this hand surgeon said, in 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 the hand surgery area because if they really need to rehab. If 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 you operate and they will just become stiff if there's no rehabilitation really early on, like within days. So this is really, really important to think about, especially in the shared decision making. If you're using Aaron Sayal's tactic of immobilizing a joint and doing a x-ray the next couple of days, maybe then it's all right. But if it's two weeks or three weeks, then you really have to think about uh, and maybe talk with the patient. Should we do this? Should we not? Should we take the risk of not immobilizing and then risking that kind of fracture that we might risk? Or should we... Um, should we uh, should we immobilize and and then see if the um, see if there is a fracture in, in two weeks? It's it's a tough decision, and there might be local differences between depending on when you can get a new X-ray, whether you can get a CT or an MRI and so on and so forth. Again, the scaphoid fracture is a classical example here, but there are so many other examples. Sometimes we need to think about what kind of casts we should use as well. So for scaphoid fractures, I believe we were told that there was some evidence that, uh, new evidence that says that you shouldn't, you don't need to immobilize um, that much with a big cast. You can you can use a, use, you can use a um, radial cast, um, which will uh, not immobilize the elbow joint, not immobilize all the other, so you can actually use your hand much more. And it, it's like, do the minimal <laughs> amount of immobilization, but do it if you, if it's needed. That's kind of the takeaway. Okay, and then the last here is classification. And classifications are more, mostly glorified, the communication tools. Um, <laughs> these are not my words. It's, it's, it, it's, um, it's uh, the orthopedic surgeons on this course, partly at least. So what do I mean by that? Well. Arun Sayal would say that there are some truths hidden in the in the um, in the um, classification of fractures, and that that's true. Um, it but most of it is descriptive. It's nothing to do with ev any evidence-based treatment. Like if this is a um, if, if this is a Nears um, or a, or a, or a Gardner. Uh, or a um, uh, rockwood, I think it's called a clavicle. If if these are like if 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 this if, if it's categorized in a type one or type two, then it's usually just descriptive, and it's mainly used for communication to your orthopedic surgeon. Oh, that's if they, if they can't look at the X-ray. Oh, that's how it looks. Okay, it's a type two. Well, then we should probably um, do it like this. But it's it's not that each type has their own evidence attached to it. There are certain 
um, classification systems that have. I, I believe the we were told that the elbow fractures have a, such a classification system with the coronoid fractures. But it's 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 the it's, the, um, it's not the rule. <laughs> it's, it's usually the exception. So um, so just know that these classification systems are usually made in, in, used in science and communication. Uh, communication with your with your consultant more so than that they're clinically useful and and will like type one is is treatment a type two is treatment b and type three is treatment c that's not how it's used and that's no no that's that, that there's no evidence for such okay okay so this is um so this was part 1a of um um of this orth orthopedic lecture um and we'll now go into a more um, more specific uh, approach to the uh, to the orthopedic surgeon um, patient in the emergency department. Okay, so stay tuned.